we're going to move on to our keynote speaker of the day, uh, Ms. Ch Jackie Patterson. Um, I just want to tee this up before her bio. Uh, this event, um, before we got together on this event, we brainstormed with some of our community partners on how we can make this event better. And a conversation with Jackie and some others um, inspired this topic. Um, inspired this direction. So once again, I want to say thank you to Jackie and thank you to our panelists. Jackie Patterson is the director of the NAACP Environmental and Climate Justice Program. Since 2007, Patterson has served as a coordinator and co-founder of Women of Color United. Jackie Patterson has worked as a researcher, program manager, coordinator, advocate, and activist working on women's rights, violence against women, HIV and AIDS, racial justice, economic justice, and environmental and climate justice. Patterson served as a senior women's rights policy, policy analyst for Action Aid, where she integrated a women's rights lens for the issues of food rights, macroeconomics, and climate change, as well as the intersection of violence against women and HIV and AIDS. Previously, she served as assistant vice president, vice president of HIV AIDS programs for IMA World, World Health, Pro, providing management and technical assistance to medical facilities and programs in 23 countries in Africa and the Caribbean. Patterson served as the outreach project associate for the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities and research coordinator for John Hopkins University. She also served as the U.S. Peace Corps volunteer in Jamaica, in, in Jamaica. Uh, she has a, pub, a, a, a ton of publications, but just a couple that we want to that we want to mention is Jobs versus Health: An Unnecessary Dilemma, Climate Change as a Civil Rights Issue, Gulf Oil Drilling Disaster: Gendered Layers of Impact, uh, Disasters, Climate Change Uproot of Women of Color, Cold Blooded, C O A L, Putting Profits Before Before People, and more. She holds a master's degree. Um, in public health from Johns Hopkins. Um, I mean, I can go on and on about Jackie, but I would really love for her to get in her keynote. Uh, welcome everyone, Jackie Patterson, our keynote speaker. Thank you so much. It's, it's an honor to be here with you all today, um, having this conversation. And the previous speaker, I don't want to botch his name, but is it Ime or am I? Ime. MA, yes. Um, I uh, deeply appreciated um, the, both of the videos and it also harkened back to my work as a sign language, ended up working as a sign language interpreter in the uh, Disaster Recovery Center post Hurricane Katrina, which really um, brought to light as we talk about um, making sure that people have their own voices, just the need for for, uh, for the, the leadership of, of people who are with hearing impairments in, in, uh, in dis designing our disaster infrastructure. So I deeply appreciate it um, uh, really being brought back to, to those memories and to that disability rights work um, that is so critical to what we're talking about today, which is around uh, access leadership, frontline, frontline community leadership. So, Again, a pleasure to have this conversation with you all today. I, uh, as the the work of the NAACP around um, climate change and and really seeing the frame around uh, around environmental injustices and climate change through a civil rights lens, it's been an interesting uh, journey. When we first uh, started to do some of our educational educational um, sessions at our annual C civil rights advocacy institutes i would i would bring a um i would i would have a, in the program climate justice 101 and people would come in listen participate with enthusiasm and afterwards after one of the sessions we did again this was when the program was first started someone walked out and they said oh i saw climate justice 101 i thought this was going to be about the climate of injustice in the world. Um, another time, another session I did soon after, someone walked out and said, similarly, oh, climate justice 101, this is great. I really see the connection, but 
when I saw Climate Justice 101, I thought this was going to be about the climate of workplace discrimination. That's how kind of far this notion of climate change was from the conception of our own constituency of what a civil rights advocacy issue is. So we had some distance to go in terms of having a conversation around, around how climate impacts us not to mention what justice looks like. And as we started to have that conversation, it became clear that people knew. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't something that we had to, to teach folks. It was just really the language of climate change and the way the issue had been portrayed in the media or otherwise that, uh, that separated it from people's actually lived experiences with the emphasis on polar bears and ice caps and so forth. It, uh, it didn't necessarily resonate with what people were experiencing in terms of changing, changes in their fisheries or the pollution that they were experiencing that they had in common with the harms of the planet harming their bodies and well-being and the shifts in agricultural yields that they were experiencing in their communities and so forth and so on. And so there was the, the birth of the program was through hearing, hearing these stories and understanding these connections and beginning to, to build a program that helped to, to, to build the capacity of people to, as we say, advocate for their own liberation, for our own liberation. And as we started to, to pave that path, those paths, uh, it was very clear that we needed to go deep a lot of the the interventions that were happening were were, were fairly so superficial you know talking about green jobs and talking about um there is a comprehensive climate legislation that was using uh, market-based mechanisms to try to change our our political system and our policymaking system but not really seeing the, the the depth of where we've come from and what what is causing um, African American communities in particularly in particular to be disproportionately impacted so as we dig deep we know that um, for African Americans, historical, social, political, and economic disenfranchisement has been detrimental to our generational resilience, while the, our culture, our brilliance, and our sheer survivalist grit have been protective factors that have been, enabled us to not only survive, but in some cases to try to, to eke out some glimmers of joy amidst the, the, the challenges. But we recognize that, and particularly I'm, I'm appreciative of the Green Building Alliance for, for, for really seeing the importance of this racial justice analysis as we think about our, our way forward. Um, as we think about the history, we have uh, 400 years since the start, uh, since the, the first enslaved African arrived um, in this nation after making the transatlantic journey. But we, and, and so that person and the, that those, the people and everyone who has come since really were taken away from what would have been their and our generational wealth and taken away from our families, taken away from our land, and then brought here in the, in the culls of ships as cargo, literally as cargo, to become someone else's generational wealth. Um, and so in spite of the Emancipation Proclamation being signed in 1863, we know that there are Black people who didn't know that they were free. Um, thus, they truly weren't free from enslavement until well into the 60s. And in the vein of no one is free when one is oppressed, that means that we as a people truly haven't been free within the lifetime of some of the people who may even be on this call. But enslavement takes so many forms. Um, in many ways, in the true sense of liberation, we still aren't free because structural racism continues to exploit and oppress every single second of every single minute of every single hour of every single day. We have, and, and it's been aided and abetted by the institutionalization of, of laws and regulations and policies and practices that, that institutionalize this oppression and this exploitation. Um, when we talk about the building sector, we know that it starts with um, with black. The, the fact that we that again, without generational wealth, the the land is um, is something that we have had a hard time in beginning to own in the first place, and even to be able to hold on to. In 1861 and 1862, the United States government passed the Morrill and Homestead Acts 
which were intended to give land grants to white Americans for colleges and for those who are seeking land to farm. And these acts were also accompanied by offers of subsidies to facilitate acquisition and use of the land. The slave, since slavery wasn't abolished at that time until 1865, many of the enslaved and even people who became free were unable to benefit from these acts. So from the very beginning, from coming over as, as chattels and, 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 and being subjected to such chattel slavery, but even as emancipation began to happen, then we had policies that kept us um, behind. So I have to plug in my computer again before it goes off. <laughs> so I, every once in a while I have to unplug and plug it back in in order for the power to keep blowing, who knows. Anyway, and so even in, so once those policies were enacted that put us further behind, then even the lack of legal services meant that African Americans who managed to acquire land couldn't even write the legally binding wills that would facilitate and legalize the inheritance of that property. So again, I don't have to keep saying it over and over again, but we were taken away from what would have been our inherited property, brought here as cargo, enslaved and became other people's property. Um, and enslavement, and then even as kind of um, emancipation started to take place, the legal and um, political and policy-based um, structural challenges persisted. And so we come to today where um, our overall economic security has resulted in insecurity has resulted in extreme income and wealth differentials at $171,000 of net worth for a typical white family is nearly 10 times greater than that of an African-American family, which is uh, $17,000. And for Black single women-headed households, the average um, family net worth is $5. So again, these are the, the types of wealth differentials. We're less likely to be homeowners at 44% versus 75% of white Americans and 65% for the overall nation. Historic and modern day redlining practices that impact everything from whether we own homes to where we own homes and the quality of the homes and other resources to which we have um, um, access. And then we also know that there we, we end up in places often that have been disinvested. And even when we go to places, disinvestment often follows. And we've seen how even now in the in the 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 not even I wouldn't even call it dog whistle, but we're hearing in the news about about this kind of fear mongering about when we come to the suburbs and, and so forth um, being being put out over the news lines. Um, and how that that further entrenches those that kind of segregation and separation of resources and disinvestment that happens in communities. We 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 um, we know that African Americans are forty percent more likely to be homeless. African American families are fifty cent fifty percent more likely to be homeless than white American families. We know that women of color are more likely than, than anyone else to experience housing insecurity. Then once we do have homes and we're in the in places because of segregation, we are more likely to live in floodplains, more likely to, to be to experience the urban heat island effect, more likely to live next to toxic facilities. African American families um, are 71 percent of African Americans live in counties in violation of air pollution standards. An African American family making fifty thousand dollars a year is more likely to live next to a toxic facility than a white American family making fifteen thousand dollars a year. And we, and we also know that our crum crumbling infrastructure is a challenge in our communities when we see that um, that we're less likely to have uh, whether everything from from roads without potholes to to sound barriers against highways to uh, levees that have been reinforced. Um, we we know that at, in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, when they built up the levees seven years after, the Army Corps of Engineers was asked why they hadn't built up the levees around Plaquemines Parish after they were inundated by Hurricane Matthew. They said, well, we use a formula to decide which levees to reinforce, and the, the formula um, applies points to each levy based on what the economic impact would be if it was overtaken. So again, it institutionalizes that people who who have the most vulnerability and the least wherewithal to, to be protected, whether it's housing stock or 
floodplains or all these other factors are the least likely to actually be protected by infrastructure. So again, it, it continues to compound and leave communities in a certain situation. A housing quality besides poor housing stock, it includes more, more likely to have indoor air pollution, more likely to have energy burden. We also less likely to have homeowners insurance. Uh, because of the financial insecurity, we're less likely to maintain homeowners insurance when it's a choice because food, electricity, medicine are the uh, choices that, that would come, come above something that would just protect us against if something would happen <laughs> versus when something is happening, such as hunger or the need for lights or the need to, 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 to treat um, illnesses, which again are more proliferant in our communities because of where we live and because of the conditions we're subjected to. So as we think about even uh, as an environment, when we were, when we we're starting to do this work with the Centering Equity and the Building Sector, which I'll talk more about, we, um, we, we recognize that for our communities and too many of our, in our communities that prison actually is an environment that we need to think about in terms of, of, in terms of prison conditions. We know that black people are, are incarcerated at five times the rate of white people. We know that black men comprise 34% of the prison population, but yet only tw um, 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 12, black folks only comprise 12% of the of the nation's population. We know that black women are twice as likely to be incarcerated than white women. And we also know the prison conditions. Many, so many prisons are built on, on um, Superfund sites or uh, next to other contaminated or uh, toxic facilities. We know that there's very little con um, attention given to to, to um, having safe, sanitary, and health healthy prison conditions. That, and that water is contaminated in so many of our prisons. We also know how. Uh, I was watching the news the other day about these wildfires, and they were saying you know, because of the early release of inmates because of COVID-19, those resources aren't available to, to fight fires. And again, you know, whether we're coming over as cargo of ships or seen as resources to fight fires, that further kind of objectification of people. And, and again, the, the call for Black Lives to Matter and humanity to be infused into how we're viewed in terms of our existence is called into question there. In fact, when we were doing research on this very topic of inmate labor and disasters, we found that there were that when you look at county records in certain counties that inmates were like listed next to tractor trailers or desks as kind of commodities with a number a value next to it next to those numbers i mean next to the the uh, line item in a in a county budget um, so again objectification um, and dehumanization and so we see how all of that plays out in terms of gentrification and displacement, um, uh, disaster and displacement, sea level rise and displacement, housing security is offering a buffer against societal sh shocks because we know that disaster assistance is tied to housing ownership or you can take out a second mortgage or all these things you can do if you have housing security and we tend too often not to. Energy improvement is even tied to home ownership um, and so forth. So as we see these impacts, even in the context of COVID-19, we know that uh, this is gearing up to be, again, watching the news, the another, the hottest year on record once again. We see how that plays out in terms of the forest fires, but also how that plays out in terms of the stay-at-home orders when you don't have a home that actually has air conditioning. Well, I just re re watched the film Cooked, which talked about the heat waves and the impacts on, on communities in Chicago and all the, the folks who died of, in, in the context of that heat wave. And so now without having cooling centers in the context of COVID-19 in urban heat highlands, we again are um, at risk as they have record high temperatures um, in different places across the, well, for the nation as a whole, but in the, in the globe, but also particular communities. I'm now working with a community called Sand Branch, Texas, which is just 14 miles outside of Dallas. It's all uh, primarily Black community, 85% African American. Um, it used to be 500 people. It's a former freedmen's um, settlement, meaning um, it was a place where, where people, enslaved people who were freed 
were um, settled and, and developed a community, but that community has never had running water. And as of the 1980s, they no longer even have the well water that they were using before because it got contaminated and, and never was remediated. So they rely solely on bottled water for their existence and well being at a time when sanitation is so critical for survival. So there's so many examples of how these, these, these challenges play out and negatively for our communities, but then there's also as many examples of hope. Um, so getting to the, to the positive part here. Um, as we talked about, I mean, as again was shown in the video, there is so much in, in resistance and so much in the, the natural resilience that our communities have shown, so much in the spirit and the passion and the commitment to liberation that our communities and allies are, are, are now um, are pulling around us to, 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 to try to exact. There's a recognition that just tweaking these fundamentally flawed systems is not gonna be enough and we need true systems transformation. I wouldn't have thought of a, that the day would come when they would, uh, in, in my lifetime, at one point, I wouldn't have thought that there would be uh, kind of pulling together around the defunding of police and really starting over and re-envisioning, re again, uh, reimagining what, um, what community safety can look like in a way that really affirms humanity. Um, I am excited to see the, the dawning of the local food movements through, um, through uh, not the dawning, but the, 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 the expansion and scaling of local food movements um, that have already been started by group, great groups like Soul Fire um, and other uh, in, in New York and other, and, and actually I was excited in, in the beginning of my work with the, um, with the NAACP to visit the landslide um, community, I think it is in Pittsburgh, um, Yvonne um, Singletary, I believe, and now this all off down my head, but um, was uh, just inspired to see that community that was coming together in that neighborhood to 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 grow together in terms of food and um, and also to provide food to people who were in need in the community in terms of indigent um, members of the community that were able to be served through their Wednesday um, food service that they gave from the bounty from their community garden and now through the awesome mutual aid efforts that are going on across the country, including our very own Mandy Lee, who's on the phone. Um, allies are really pulling together to, to, to see that, that liberation is in sovereignty and liberation is in community ownership and community-led efforts such as around local food. We're seeing around the country where people are beginning to recognize that energy justice means actually, it means sovereignty, it means pulling together and figuring out how to develop community owned microgrids so we can start growing, you know, having our own energy through natural resources and don't pollute and harm people and planet. So, I want to uh, I want to bring to a close in the last kind of minute because I know I have 20 minutes to speak here, um, but the Centering Equity in the Sustainable Building Sector, again, led by by um, by Mandy Lee and with great organizations like um, GBA, um, groups, groups and individual architects, affordable housing people, public health um, organizations and individuals and people who are leaders in education, energy advocates and so forth are all coming together to 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 advance training and education, design competitions, model product projects, um, research, um, and shifting the way we do sustainable building standards and so forth to really make sure that we are in a place where we all have um, safe, safe, healthy, disaster resilient places to, to where we live, work, play, worship. And, and thrive. And so, uh, so it's super exciting to have this partnership with Green Building Alliance to recognize that we are, that, that where we, that whether it's starting with land and home ownership and land security to the very buildings and built environment in general is essential to this vision of liberation, of sovereignty, of, of really ha making sure that we have access to the commons in a quality way that, um, that, that that ensures that we're all that embraces our, our the humanity of everyone and the rights the rights and um, and the not just the rights as from a civil rights and legal perspective but what is right in terms of dig dignity in terms of not just survival but actually thriving as people so 
Thank you. I will uh, wrap there and hand it back to our moderator. <laughs> Thank